So for those of you who can't get enough of this land this evening, next week uh, we are premiering our documentary, This May Be the Last Time, here in New York City. So I hope, uh, hope you'll consider attending that, uh, and we'll have uh, information about it uh, afterwards. Um, the documentary uh, captures this really amazing story about uh, the root of American music and its intersection with uh, Native American hymns that were being uh, sung in the 1800s. Uh, that is just one of a wealth of uh, wonderful stories coming out of our uh, Native American coverage. And uh, one of those stories uh, came out uh, uh, about a year ago, I think it was, um, that uh, it was called From One Fire, and it was the extraordinary story of a, uh, a man championing uh, civil rights within the Cherokee Nation, uh, all while, you know, it was a year, uh, battle that lasted for years, and it is still ongoing, but he was doing this all while he was a clerk at a pet store in Oklahoma. Uh, the story is beautifully told by Marcos uh, Barbary, who's here tonight. He's our next uh, presenter. Uh, he, most recently, he is the author of John's School, another uh, story set in Oklahoma. Uh, he's a journalist and a documentary filmmaker. So, Marcos, please uh, come on up. Hey everyone, thank you so much for having me. So, uh, not that long ago, I was in school um, in Boston and um, I had bought a van and decided that it would pr probably be like least expensive to uh, just get a parking pass um, at, in our sort of big parking lot and park the van at the top um, and I lived up there and I, and I went to school there and the school year was sort of winding down and I was really desperate to get a job. And so um, late one night in May, I answered an, uh, an ad for a private tutor in New York City. And it was like one of these advertisements where, you know, you needed to sort of be, be everything. You needed to speak Spanish, you needed to speak French, you needed to do all these things. And of course, I didn't really know how to do any of them, but I pretended that I did and I got a call the next morning from a very mysterious person. And um, he said, can you come down to New York the day after tomorrow? I'd like to interview you. And um, I jotted down his address and there was no apartment number. And I thought, well, God, I don't know anyone who doesn't have an apartment number in New York City. Um, so I thought I better go and like buy a suit. So I went and I bought a suit and I kept the tags um, of the suit so I could return it afterwards. And I went down, um, and sure enough, there, it wasn't a mistake. There was no um, apartment number. It was this massive mansion on the Upper East Side. And so I walked in and um, sort of got brought up by different levels of staff members up to you know, the very top of the place. And um, I landed the job. I landed the job, and I made all my plans to spend the summer uh, in, in New York City and lined it up with the girlfriend at the time. We we're gonna have this really fabulous summer. And then I went back to the school, finished up, and they flew me back down to New York because they had a stylist that was gonna work with me for like three days and buy all these clothes for the summer. And I was like, this is so strange. This is just the most bizarre people and family. And um, as I was trying on these clothes and sort of having the shopping spree, my girlfriend, you can imagine, is like incredibly jealous that I now have a private stylist. Um, she, she keeps alluding to the fact that like, you know, uh, she kept saying things like, oh God, it's gonna be so hot over there. Are you sure that you sure you're gonna wanna wear this? Um, and eventually, I sort of called her out and I was like, what are you talking about? And she was like, have you ever spent a summer in Oklahoma, and I was like, no, I've, but I know what New York City summers like. You know, it's not so bad. And then she um, sort of broke open the fact that this, this job had nothing to do with New York City, that the day the little kid gets out of school, that you're getting on a private jet and you're going to Oklahoma, and you're gonna spend the entire summer in Oklahoma. Um, 
So the plans uh, to spend the summer in New York City were dashed, but I got sort of introduced. Um, I landed in, um, in an airport. There are two airports in Oklahoma City. One is called um, the Will Rogers Airport, and one is the Wiley Post Airport. Of course, both those people died in plane crashes. It's sort of the first in bizarre introduction to um, the state of Oklahoma and some of their thinking. And um, I spent uh, about three full summers while I was in school in Oklahoma. And when I finished school, I started a, a company called Thread and uh, started making sort of multimedia documentaries and syndicating them. And I went to report in all kinds of places and countries, Venezuela and Guatemala and Syria. And uh, there was still this sort of ultimate pull back to this fascinating place. And the person I ended up working for those summers, and we became really good friends. And he ended up um, uh, investing in some of my work and in Thread. And um, over time, I was just, I just was in Oklahoma with a crew, and I stumbled across, I was at the Cherokee Nation, I was in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, and I stumbled across this story um, that I had never heard before, which is that Native Americans own slaves. I thought that I was really smart, and I thought that I knew a lot about history, certainly a lot about Oklahoma, but I had no idea that Native Americans own slaves, that they sided with the Confederacy during the Civil War. And, um, and what was happening when I arrived there and I started shooting is that 140 years later after signing this treaty, the Cherokee Nation starts kicking out all of their black looking Native Americans, saying, you're not real Indians by blood. Um, and I just became obsessed with the story and I, I made a short video about it and I did a lot of other things. And then I came out and very seriously said, this is gonna be a feature length documentary film. And when I was shooting out there doing the historical section about race in Oklahoma, I met Michael Mason and I met the good folks over at This Land and interviewed a few of them for the film. And I was just fascinated by This Land. They were doing radio, they had this amazing video series going, it's long form journalism. Um, it was sort of this really dreamy company um, that's just gotten better and better. And so I asked um, Michael if I could take a portion of the film and turn it into a long form magazine story. So that sort of began our relationship. And while I was making the film, I wrote the story. And now the film is done and we're doing the film festival circuit. We just came back from um, the New Orleans International Film Festival. The film is called By Blood. And, um, and I still am just utterly fascinated by this place that you would think was like the most boring state and place you would just, you know, dread to be sent to instead of New York. But um, if you haven't been out there, I urge you to go and um, please, you know, subscribe to this land and uh, support their work. Thank you so much.